go. Here we go. Testing one, two. Get a seat. We'll get started. It's 10 o'clock. 10.01. Good morning. Welcome to Simple Truth Church. It's great to be here this morning. Absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning. Hope you had a great fourth. Hope you had a good week. My week, kind of, it kind of stunk. My next door neighbors are the old ladies across the street. I only say old ladies because they're a little bit older than me. And uh, anyway, they, their little dog got skunked. Yeah, well, that they can't smell. So when I went over to the house, I said, man, your house stinks. Your dog got skunked. And they're like, it did? Well, we saw a skunk in the front yard, and she went running after him. And then she came back, and she was wiping her face off, and she was wiping her. And then she went in, and she sleeps with her mama. So she wipes her face all over her bed. So the whole house, but they didn't. They can't smell it, so they're good with it. So I put a have a heart trap out, and it took me two nights to get it. And uh, it was a big skunk. And so I, I walk up to it, you know, and if you, I learned because I've caught a lot of them and got them out of the neighborhood because they, you know, skunk our dogs. If you, uh, if you catch a skunk, they grab everything they can in, after they eat with the bait. They grab everything they can from, from outside the cage. They pull it in the cage, and then they make a little bed. And when you get there in the morning and it's light, they're rolled up in a ball, tight little ball sound asleep. So when I, lay, when I put the peanut butter sandwich in the, uh, in the have a heart trap, I... Uh, put it on a bed of pine needles and leaves. And so when I get there in the morning, sure enough, it's rolled up in a ball, just sound asleep. And all the way around the whole edge of the cage is perfectly clean, they, as far as they could reach, a perfect straight line. And so, you know, usually you talk to them and you hold up a, a towel that where they can't see you. And you just talk real calmly and you set the towel over the top of the cage. And so was, when I started doing that, it shot the towel. And... Uh, which was okay because it didn't shoot me. And then I take it eight miles away and let it go because I heard that they can come back eight miles. And I used to mark them with an orange marker. I'd mark their, their tails so I could see if they really came back eight miles, but I never found one with an orange marker. So if you see you know, a skunk in your yard with orange on its head or his tail... Uh, don't bring it back. It's not mine. Anyway, hope you had a good 4th of July. Yeah, it was quiet, really quiet. I rode up to Chico on the motorcycle. Lori drove up to Chico. She's up there with our granddaughter. And uh, so we had, she had some, a replacement for worship, and then the mandate came out. But it says... I was thinking, hey, you know what? It's we can worship. We're gonna, you know, we can worship because we worship in more ways than singing songs. You know, we worship in uh, giving. In fact, somebody put a note up here. It says, for the sake of online viewers, remind that they can worship by giving online. And then uh, we worship in the Word. You know, I, I remember talking to a, a worship leader one time, and he says, I get paid to play my style. And I said, uh, people don't care about your style. People don't come here to listen to your style. That's not why they come to church. They come to church to hear the word of God. And we don't even need a worship leader. I told them we could put it. And I said, we don't even need a pastor. I could go away too. And we could put it a CD of the Bible up here and we could sit here and listen to the Bible and people would still come to church. That's why they're here. So anyway, and I was talking to uh, my daughter and about the whole mask situation and, and she says, hey dad, just wear a stinking mask. How hard is that for you? They're not going to get rewards out at the end because this too shall pass. She says, how hard is that? 
for you to wear a mask so everybody feels the same. And then you protect the other people. Don't worry, if you're not worried about you, protect other people. At least make them feel like we're united. And so, you know, I was thinking, of, I told you guys this story anyway about the Pentecost, you know, and the little flames, that it appeared like there was little flames on everybody in the room when they received the Holy Spirit. I thought, hey, you know what? God did that so nobody else would think they were more spiritual than anybody else. That nobody else would think they know more than anybody else. That everybody was on the same team and they were united. So that's my guilt trip for today. Anyway, here we are. This too shall pass. I'll do some announcements. Most of them are the same. You got them memorized. And uh, we, we don't have that church office anymore, so thank you. People that came and helped cleaned it out, it's spotless, and uh, their owners are happy, and it, we're onward and upward. We're talking to people about the uh, holiday market there, that the old one. So we'll see how that works out. We're in communication with them, and then uh, we'll continue to work on that, continue to pray for that. And then let's see. You guys know all the rest of those. You can go online and see what those are. And then we have uh, prayer requests. We need to pray for my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law lives in Anaheim with my sister. Uh, That's what makes him my brother-in-law. And uh, her name is Miriam. And uh, we call her Mimi. And she got a hold of me because John has a, they found some cancer in his lung. And they're supposed to go in tomorrow and have this cancer removed. But because of the uptick of uh, COVID virus, the hospitals are getting, uh, they're not, now they're canceling those kind of serious uh, things down at that hospital. And so she said, hey, just pray that he can get in tomorrow at the scheduled time to get that cancer taken out of him. So we'll pray for that. Continue to pray for uh, uh, Jeff Ellis' stepfather and Tom Kristoff, he's still hanging in there. Nancy Berger in ICU down in uh, Chico. Really? Oh, okay, he's in Southern California. He's from Chico. Something like that. Okay. God knows where he is. Anyway, he's got has some liver issues. And so uh, we'll uh, pray for him as well. Anybody have any prayer requests? Well, that's praise. Nancy Berger's cancer-free. So she had a radical mastectomy, and they didn't find any cancer in her lymph nodes. So she's cancer-free. Praise the Lord for that. That's awesome. Wow. Wow. Uh Uh-huh. Wow. Did she say did she get saved in jail? Cool. Well good. That's what counts. Right on. Let's pray. Oh we and we do want to pray for our uh, men and women in the armed forces and and local uh well, not only local, but all first responders. But those will be scrolling. We can pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this absolutely gorgeous Sunday morning that we can come together. and We come together and worship you. And it's, it's because of what we have in common in our lives and our relationship with Jesus that brings us here. And so thank you for that. And Lord, I just pray that you'd pour out your spirit upon us. Lord, that you would pour out your grace upon us as we spend this time together this morning. And we're going to spend this time together this morning just uh, pleading with you and praying for others. Lord, that we would uh, offer up petitions. Lord, that you would heal people that 
need to be healed. You're the great physician, and, and we know that you can just reach in and, and fix people, and, and that would be our prayer, and that would be our cry, is, Lord, we're thankful that Nancy Berger's cancer-free. We're thankful for that. You're an amazing God that, you, that we have that kind of technology that you can fix that before it gets crazy. But, Lord, we just pray that for, it, for everybody that has those kind of issues going on in their life. Lord, that you would reach in and, and just fix them before it's crazy. Just pray that, uh, that, that my brother-in-law, John, will find favor tomorrow and, and he'll be able to get in and, and you'll give the doctors wisdom, Lord, and they'd be able to. I'd love it if they went in there and they just found that it wasn't even cancerous. It was just a spot. And so uh, we pray for that. We pray for those others that are on our, our prayer requests. Lord, we just ask you to uh, do an amazing thing, Lord, that there would be more praise reports, and we promise to give you all the praise and the glory. Lord, we pray for those that are uh, serving our country. Pray that you would bless them as well, the sacrifices they make, and bless their families. Lord, we also pray that you would uh, keep our first, uh, first responders safe, Lord. Pray that, that uh, you would just keep them out of harm's way, Lord, in the craziness that's going on in this United States of America, in this world, Lord, we just pray that you keep your hand upon those that, that serve us, Lord, that sacrifice for us, and Lord, that are doing what they're called to do. And so, Lord, again, we're thankful that we can be here this morning. We pray you, that you would be blessed by this time we spend together and that uh, you would bless us as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was looking in... in uh, I'm going to take this off so I can breathe. It's like, wow. I know there's a guy that was here last week. He says, I can't wear that mask because my blood satur uh, saturation is uh, like 92 or something. And then it really drops with this. But my disclaimer is, is I'm, I'm 12 feet away from anybody, okay? But I'm going to read Psalm 33. And, uh, and I was just reading over this because we're not going to be in Psalm 33 this morning. But I was just reading over this and I thought, wow, this is uh, apropos. And the psalmist, he says, uh, shout for joy in the Lord. O oh, you righteous, praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear, fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all children of man. From there, he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. The warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. Behold... The eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. 
He is our help and our shield. For our, glad, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O oh Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. And so I was, I was pondering that. I was thinking about that. And I thought about Jeremiah after the fall of Jerusalem. He's lamenting, right, in Lamentations. He's lamenting. He's social distanced. Not because there's a pandemic, it's just he's about sick and tired of people, right? And so he's sitting under a tree someplace and he says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. Great is thy faithfulness. I thought, wow, man, that sounds better than my motorcycle helmet when I was heading down here. <laughs> you know. But then I thought, you know what, that's not singing. That's, that's not chanting. That's making a joyful noise. And see, that's where, you know, I push the boundaries. Is that, hey, if the, if, if the governor specifically wanted us to not make a joyful noise, then he would have said, don't, we're not making joyful noises. But So that is... That's worship. That's worship. And we spend time in the word of God and you read that. And so it brings us to a, a Psalm 90. As, as we've been going through a, f- a few psalms, you know, this Psalm 90, from everlasting to everlasting. And as we talked about it last week, how the psalms is, is broken up into, you know, five books. And so if you look at Psalm 1 in your Bible, right up on the top of the page, at least in the ESV, it says book 1. Never thought about that, why that says book one. Okay, so we talked about it last week, how how it's broken up into five books, and those five five books correspond with the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. And so I I was reading through Psalm 90 because I use Psalm 90 as a a psalm that I, I teach from at a graveside memorial. In Psalm 90 here, it introduces the fourth book of the Psalms. This is where it breaks into the fourth book of the Psalms. And this is the oldest. In other words, this is the earliest. This is the earliest of the Psalms. It's the only Psalm attributed to Moses, although some commentators, some uh, scholars believe that Psalm 91, the next Psalm, is, that's not attributed to anybody, is, is one that he wrote as well because it ties in somewhat. But Psalm 90 corresponds to the book of, of Numbers in the Pentateuch. Okay, the book of Numbers is, is a book of wanderings. You know, remember that, how it's the book of wanderings in the wilderness, and it's the story of the, the failure of man. And, and so it's appropriately found right here in this Psalm 90. So Moses probably wrote this psalm at the end of his wilderness wanderings where he's leading the people. And, and just before he died, and this is right here is a tremendous statement. It's a tremendous statement of God's divine glory. And it opens up with a powerful declaration of the greatness of God. In Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, Moses says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from ever Lasting to everlasting, you are God. So in that brief and concise statement right there, that brief and concise sentence, there's three great facts that indicate the greatness of God. You know, Moses begins by declaring that God has been the dwelling place of man for all generations. So a dwelling place is where we live, right? That's, that's where we dwell. That's we, it's where we live. It's, it's our home. And this is a declaration that God has been man's home from the very beginning. Ever since man was on earth, God has been his home. So in all generations, it's where every generation continually lives. The, the, the Apostle Paul made the same declaration on Mars Hill in Acts 17. You know, he's talking to the, to the Athenian, the, you know, the uh, leaders of Athens. And uh, you, you always love this when you read Acts 17, verses 22 through 28. It says, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Aragopas, Arapagus or whatever, 
He's standing in the midst. He says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind the breath and everything. Life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries for their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and breathe and have our being, as even some of our own of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So it's an amazing, it's an amazing thought. It's an, it, you know, it's an amazing thought to think that God exists as a home for mankind. That's pretty amazing. And here Moses, he's looking back over the course of human history. He's, he's looking backwards and he's declaring that God is great because God is the God of history. And even with the passing centuries, there's no change in that relationship between man and God. All these centuries have passed, and, and that hasn't changed. He's been the home of man for all generations in history. And then Moses points out that God is the God of creation in our text in verse 2a. He says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world. So he begins with a geological fact right here. He's going to give us a you know, geology lesson here. He says, The mountains were brought forth. They were formed after the earth had been created. And so he's, he's looking back and he's saying the mountains were formed, but before that, God was. And he, and, he, and he formed the earth and the world. And that's not saying the same thing. He's not saying the same thing that he says he formed the earth and the world. That's, they're two different things. In the Hebrew, it's literally he formed the earth and the land. So God formed the earth first, and later he brought forth the land out of the waters. And you can read that. It's confirmed in Genesis 1, verses 9 and 10. So Moses is, is, is moving back in time from, from creation of the earth itself to the appearance of land from the waters. And before all this, he says, God was. He was from everlasting to everlasting. And then he takes a huge leap into timelessness and says in, in verse 2b... Again, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We, we can't understand that. We can't wrap our brains around it. And, and he's going to talk about that a little more here. But, but here is the greatness of God. He is the God of history. He is the God of creation. And even more, he is the God of eternity. And he is beyond and above his creation. He is greater than the universe he produced. And, and before it existed, he was. This mighty God, this incredible being who says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So that mighty God, that incredible being who said that is, is now brought close to us in the rest of this psalm this morning. So here Moses is examining the relationship of, of God to man. And that's the theme right here of this psalm. So how do we relate to the greatness of God? Again, he gives us three great facts beginning in verse 3. Verses 3 through 6 back in our text. He says, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight is but yesterday when it is past." Or as a watch in the night, you sweep them away as with a flood. They're like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. So this right here, it indicates the, the limits that, that God placed on life. 
We all have limits in our life, right? And he, this indicates right here, Moses is telling us that God put limits on life. And, and these are great facts of human existence. And the great fact is, is we live under the sovereignty of God, that God's in control of everything. He's in absolute control of everything. And, and God is in control in that he's in control of everything. He's in control of human life. And as Moses points out, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of man. So, again, God sets limits to that life. There are certain things, there are certain things in our life that he won't let us do. You know, what is allowed as possible is something that obviously he allows. You know, he allows us to go to the moon. He allows us to shoot to go to Mars, okay? So, obviously, God allows that. But throughout the Bible, we found, or we find that there's uh, two or three things that are kept from man's knowledge. And one of those is the understanding of time. You know, that Jesus said in Acts 1-7, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Again and again, he hints that time is a mystery which, which uh, man will never understand. Now, I remember... You know, I go in, you know, doing memorial services and stuff, and I, and I, I talk to people about how, you know, in heaven there's, I used to say there is no time, you know, because they live outside of time. You know, but uh, Jim Hook pointed out to me one day, he says, oh, no, there's time in heaven, Pastor, because there's music. And we'll be singing, so we have to keep time. You're absolutely right. There is time in heaven. But there's time in heaven that we don't understand. And Moses even breaks it down a little bit where he says, hey, you know, it's like a, a watch in the night. A thousand years is like a watch in the night. So, I mean, then you would be thinking the way he's talking is that Jesus was crucified yesterday. You know, so that's one of the things we don't understand. The nature of the occult world is, is also secret, hidden from man. I mean, probably because we couldn't handle the truth if we saw what was really going on, the war that's going on, the battle that's going on right now for our souls, for our lives. Daniel says this in Daniel 2, 21 and 22, says he changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. So God, again, sets limits to life. Man comes from the dust, but he, but he must return to the dust. Yesterday I was, you know, riding my motorcycle, like I told you, to Chico, and I cut through on uh, Woodruff Lane, and then over to Matthews, and then Ramirez, and so I'm going down Ramirez through those uh, rice fields, and there's one rice field that's not a rice field right now, and it's just a dust bowl. It's all flat, and there was equipment out there, and you could see no, no less than a dozen dust devils. They're just all over. Some of them are huge, but there's all over the place. There's got, all these dust devils are going on. And I thought, wow, those are, those are men. Those are men. Those, that's, you know, we came from dust. We're going back to dust. I couldn't tell whether they were coming or going, but that's what I thought. Then Moses points out that man also is suddenly taken from earth. In verse 5a, he says, you sweep them away as, a, as with a flood. They're like a dream. So again, it's clear that, that we live un, within the sovereignty of God, that God's in control. He's in control of every day that we live. He is in control. And so we have no control over how long we live. And, and how fast that picture must change, or, or we see that picture change. He says, it says, you sweep them away. So no one's life is at all certain. We don't have a clue, right? People can suddenly disappear from the scene, and we see that happen a lot right now. I mean, there's thousands of people that before Christmas or around Christmas didn't think they'd die in the next couple months. They'd disappear from the scene, you know, but it happens everywhere. I mean, all the time, we have, you know, Highway 49 or whatever, you People wake up in the morning and don't, they, they aren't thinking, oh, I think I'm going to die today on Highway 49. We don't have a clue. You know, but it changes so quickly. We get swept away. 
But even if they don't, in verse 5b and 6 back in our text, it says they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, and, and, even, and in the evening it fades away. You know, we know this from experience, especially, you know, when you're not young, but when you reach like 40 and 40 o- over, we know that in the normal span of life, there's this gradually increasing decay and deterioration, right, in our tents. And it's like grass. You know, it's there in the morning, and then before you know it, it's gone in the evening. It's like, what happened? Where did that time go? And so this is a picture, he says, of human life. And history, our own history confirms this. So humanity lives within this great fact about God that, that God is in sovereign control. He's in control of everything. He's in control of our lives. But there's another relationship which concerns Moses here, and it's, it's God's wrath. And, and he moves right into that in verses 7 through 12. I'll read it to you. He says, For we are brought to, to, to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all your days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. So here, this is Moses' outlook on life right here. He's looking at this and he's facing the reality that many of us try to avoid. And I'm saying us, right? There's a bittersweet quality about life. And the psalmist, all the psalmists, they they face it realistically. They're totally ready to come to grips with the fact that there's a problem with evil, in our lives. And why is, why is human life stained? Why is it stained with a dark side? You know, why do we have tragedies and trials and tribulations and injustices and, and disasters? And, and they hit both the just and the unjust, right? The rain, the rain, rain, you know, it falls on the just and the unjust. The injustices fall on the just and the unjust. So Mo- Moses, he's pointing this out, that there's a dark side to life. And, and there comes sudden things that happen, and they, they happen in our life, and they cast this cloud over our sunshine. You know, like everything's going good, everything's cool, everything's all right, and then all of a sudden, whoa, what happened? And we all know how often those th- kind of things happen. What's the reason for them? Well, Moses says it's because of the wrath of God. That's what he's pointing out here. He attributes them directly to God. According to scriptures, The wrath of God is God's moral integrity. It's God's uprightness. And so when people refuse to yield themselves to God, he creates or allows certain conditions which he has ordained for harm. He allows it. And and it is God who allows evil. He's the one that allows evil to end in sorrow and heartache and injustice and despair. So it is God's way of saying to people, Hey, people, you must face the truth. You were made for me. You were made for me. You were made to glorify God. So if you, in the honor of human choice, okay, because he's going to honor our choices, because life's all choices, in the honor of human choice, which, which he has given us, he says, you decide if you want me. And if you decide you don't want me, I'll leave. But you will have to suffer the consequences if I leave. And so the absence of God, obviously, is destructive to human life. We see it, you know, it comes in waves, right? And we see it a huge wave of it now. When, it, when you're living godless, in a godless society, and, and uh, God lets you to, uh, go, to, uh, you know, have your choices, you want your cake and eat it too, Okay, and he removes himself. You see that God, the removal of God when he removes his presence is destructive to human life. The absence of God is the wrath of God that, that can't, and God can't withhold that. 
when he lets us do what we're going to do, he, he can't withhold that because that's his moral integrity. And, and his moral integrity insists that these things should occur as a result of people's choices. We choose that. Moses links these two together. He set sin and God's wrath within the same frame. In verses 7 and 8, back in our text, he says, For we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. So then the cause of God's wrath is always man's sin. That's the cause of God's wrath. So the manifestation of God's wrath would never be apparent if it wasn't for the secret sins that are set in the, in the light of God. You think about that. We wouldn't need God's wrath. We wouldn't even know what God's wrath was if we were serving God and doing what we are supposed to be doing. Okay, so it's because of our sin that we see that God has wrath. And so when it's brought into the countenance of God, the, God's light, and he sees that, he deals with that. So God knows our inner sins, our secret inner thoughts. And the Bible never teaches us that a passing thought is a sin. You know, a thought that comes to our mind uninvited. We just get this thought, it's uninvited. And it remains there for a moment, it, tempted us, it tempts us to do something wrong. But you know what, that's normal exposure to temptation. Okay, that's, that's life, that's normal exposure. Even Jesus experienced that. But here Moses refers to thoughts that we harbor. We think about them. We meditate on them. You know, we, we, we take great pleasure in, in them, and, and, and we often bring them up ourselves when they're not un, when they're, when they're, and they're not uninvited because we invite them and we think about them. So God's aware of these inner corruptions of life, and they're, they are all contributing to the tragic sense of our life. You know, it's amazing how blind we are to this area, too. But if God's going to deal with sin, he's going to deal with all sin. He must deal with, every, with it within everybody. And, and our sin always looks worse on somebody else, right? And we can look at people on the, in the news, and we can see how things are going on. We think, hey, God, how come you let, why don't you squash those people like a bug? Why doesn't he squash me like a bug? He has to deal with sin because sin is sin. And so Moses face, faces that fact. And that, and, and that God allows his wrath, his moral integrity against sin, he allows that to be demonstrated, and he allows it to be demonstrated specifically so he has the opportunity to exercise love, so we can see his love. And then, then he goes into, on to consider Moses, to consider the uh, all-inclusiveness of this, that it's universal in Psalm 90, verse 10. He says, the years of our life are 70, or by reason of, of strength, 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They're soon gone, and, and we fly away. Well, I, Job would be the clearest demonstration of this very thing. In Job 5.7, it says, but man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. So here's a statement that Moses gives on the length of life, which is reduced under sin. Okay? At best, we're going to live you know, 70 years. But then by reason of strength, he says we could reach 80, but it's still going to be filled with trouble. And this was written by Moses, right? Moses lived to be 120 years old. And so that's probably a remarkable extension of time, especially back in his day, uh, you know, that, that he lived that long. Okay, it's remarkable that, that some 2,000 years have passed since the resurrection, and man's lifespan is only 70 or, or maybe 80 plus years. So we really haven't made it much prog progress. You know, we have all these amazing achievements in, in, in our medical field, but it hasn't changed this figure as an average of a human life span today. But still, Moses is right. No matter how long man lives, his days are filled with trouble and tragic, and the, and tragic, the trouble and tragic quality, right, of life that marks the presence of, of the wrath of God. And then he closes this section with a question in verses 11 and 12. He says, who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to, to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. I was thinking about that. Who considers the power of your, 
of your anger, you know, or the wrath according to the fear of you. Most of the time I'm more thinking about what I have to do today or tomorrow and what my priorities are and not thinking about, you know, that, that I'm in, in all I do that I would do unto the Lord and, and be pleasing unto him. That, that in that way I would avoid his wrath. I'm not, I, I don't think about that. But now he, Moses, he's contemplating this strange lack of concern of humanity. You know, why do we ignore the fact of the wrath of God? Why, why isn't that wrapped up in our priorities? Why do, we, why do we pretend it doesn't even exist? It's like it really isn't on the radar and still, until something happens. And, and we don't face up to these great relationships, you know, the great relationship of the sovereignty of God and, and the sovereignty of God over humanity and the ever-present justice of God working in our society. They're together. So why do we work so hard to blame other conditions in our human life, you know, or, or to blame everyone but the one who's most to blame, which would be ourselves. Because if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, that would make the world a better place. If we're worried about what we're supposed to be doing. And, and so that's exactly what the psalmist said that in our psalm, what, when we're in what, Psalm 72 or whatever we were in a, a few weeks ago. He was saying the same thing. Why do we blame everybody else for our problems in this world. Well, in answer, Moses says, teach us to number our days. In other words, make us aware of our limitations on life that we might get a heart of wisdom. And see, the heart of wisdom is a realistic outlook on our life. And it's facing life the way it is. And that is fully depending on the relationships of man to God, that we're going to fully depend on our relationship personally with him. And then the last section, Moses moves to the third of these relationships, and it's a declaration of of a a heart of wisdom and what that heart of wisdom will bring us. What's the result of that, having a heart of, of, of wisdom? It's a declaration of God's love for man. And he begins with this with this cry for a personal God in verse 13. He says, Return, O Lord, exclamation point. How long? Question mark. Have pity on your servants. You can tell he's crying out. See, we can't experience the love of God unless we, unless we are ready to cry out like this for a personal relationship with God. And we know that. If you have a personal relationship with God, you know what it take to what it took to have that relationship. You cry out to him for that personal relationship and say, Enter my heart, have per- have pity on me, your servant. That cry for a personal relationship. Is, is the key to the results that follow as we see in the following verses in verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So let's say that we have, that we have come to a personal relationship with God. So we know him, okay, and, and he, has, he has returned to our spirit where he was intended to dwell. And what has really happened, of course, is that, that we have returned because we dwell in him. You know, from our human point of view is we think that God has come to us and we cry out for him to come to us. But all, the whole time he is saying, come unto me. And, but as James 4.8 says, it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So let's say this happened in our life. Okay, what can we expect? First, we can expect a satisfying love, Moses says in verse 14. He says, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. So it's a continuous love. It's a love that doesn't change. It's a steadfast. It's steadfast. That's what that means. It, it's, in other words, an unconditional acceptance. It's, it's a love that satisfies it's a love that doesn't depend on whether we're good or bad. It's, you know, that we're going to earn our ways to, to uh, get this love. It doesn't depend on that. It's, it's a love that's ready to receive us. It's re- ready to forgive us and, and set us back on our feet again. And that's the kind of, of love God shows. God shows unconditional love. Love that's already been, it's, it's already dealt with our behavior, right? It's already dealt with our rebellion and still loves in spite of our behavior and our rebellion. That's satisfying love. And next he speaks of a rewarding joy. Moses says in verse 15, 
Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen. So there's a joy that makes up for, for our past, for our history, a, a, a joy that Joel, the, the prophet Joel talks about in Joel 2, 25a, he says, I will, the Lord says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. Wow. And let, it's, it's hard to even imagine what that is, but until you get older, I guess, or until you've lived through it, you know. That's one of the greatest joys of my Christian life is to look back at the wasted years of my life. I look back at the wasted years of my life, and then I put it in contrast to the fruitfulness of where I am today and what God has done in my life. You know, and, you know, back in all the craziness of my life, when my mom would say, well, God will restore the years the locusts have eaten, I think, whatever that means. But now I look back at it and go, wow, God is continually correct, correcting what was once a total hopeless, seemingly a hopeless situation. And he restores uh, to me the years the locusts have eaten. It's like, wow, you know, and then not only does he restore it, but he uses that. That's a rewarding joy. That's a part of the glory of God's love. And then the third element Moses sees is, is in verse 16. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. That's an amazing request right there. You know, it visualizes a future inherited healing. You know, you, you visualizing that, you think about, wow, the Bible recognizes the fact that, that man's tied to his past and it's affecting his immediate future. See, God himself stated it when he gave the law in, in Exodus 20, verses 5b and 6. Oh, it's this thing. It rolled? Oh. I thought I figured it out. God himself stated it in, in the giving of the law in Exodus 20. He says, For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So there's something in life that continues from one generation to another. Though we may become Christians and, and God begins to heal our personal life, we're, we're going we're, we're to never experience the full effect of that healing in this lifetime. But our children will. Our children will. That's what the psalmist is saying here. Let your work be shown to your servants. In other words, in his own generation, okay, Show us. Let me understand how you work, Lord. Give me an understanding of your ways and how you work in society and life. And then let the effect of that understanding be evidenced in my children. You see that? And so that is what often happens. You know, we've all seen, we see, you know, couples beginning a family and and they're new Christians. They're discovering for themselves the healing power of God where God can change the, the past, you know, that was wretched, miserable, w- wasted life. And then they experience much of the loving grace and kindness and restoration of God. You know, when I went through what I went through with my bride, is, is our kids were two and five. Okay, so, so this is like a picture of that. And so their, it's, their children go on to even greater and richer experiences than their parents had. You know, I, I thank God for that. I thank God that if God was going to intervene in my life and allow me to, to suffer the consequences of my own choices, I'm glad that he allowed that to happen when my kids were kids. So they're benefiting from the change and the understanding that has come into the lives of their parents. And, and a lot of you guys can testify that, to that. Okay, according to the scriptures, that benefit can be passed on to the third and the fourth generations. That is why oftentimes it's either much worse, their children are much worse or much better than their parents. You know, I I, I go up to court once in a while and I'll look at the court docket and I'll see names that I recognize. But then I see names that I recognize of people that I used to arrest and they're used to deal with and and those people are dead but then I'll go up and I'll ask them, hey, were you related to those people? 
that was my grandpa. That was my grandmother. And, and so now their, their grandkids are going through the same, they're in the same court process. So you can see how it works both ways. They're still going through it. It was passed on to generations. So it's either much better or much worse. And then the fourth, th- fourth thing in verse 17a, Moses says, let the favor or, or the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And so that's what the New Testament calls godlikeness or, or godliness. And, and what is the beauty of God? Well, God's beautiful because of two things, truth and love. And truth is always necessary for beauty. You know, we can never have anything beautiful that isn't true, right? A, a person whose life is characterized by truth and love is a beautiful person. Beauty is the, is the display of truth and love. And the only place we, we can get those in the ultimate sense is from God. And so Moses prays, back in our text, verse 17b, and establish the work of your hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Okay, establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So the last result of God's love is, is to make our labor, our work, meaningful. And we all want our labor and our work to count, right? We all want it to count for something. You know, we don't, we don't want it to be wasted or spent in a moment. We want the work of our hands, we want it to be a lasting thing. We want it to be impressive. We want it to uh, affecting others in a positive way and, and being in, in and of itself of, of great value, that, it, that it's helped people. It, you know, and, and it's in everyone's heart. There's a longing that our life would be worthwhile and, and it, that it would count and, and that we would be the kind of person that, that people would look up to, that we could leave a legacy and a godly legacy. And so this is the great promise of God's love, that, that love is available to anybody who's ready to say, who's ready to cry out like Moses did, return, O Lord, how long have pity on your servants? So he's saying, hey, come back into my life and, and work through me, Lord. And God is ready to produce that kind of love in us. So bottom line, it's like, okay, bottom line me. Bottom line, the three great facts that relate to uh, God and man are God's sovereignty, okay? He's in control of everything within the limits of which we all live, whether we like it or not, okay? A lot of people don't like it. We can see that now. A lot of people don't like it. But we live under the sovereignty of God. We live in, in his sovereignty. And then God's wrath, which, which we all experience, whether we're innocent or whether we're guilty, because we're living in a world in which God allows sin to play out, that God allows people to suffer the consequences of their actions, and that he'll turn and say, okay, you're on your own. But at the same time, there's the glory and wonder of God's love, and it displays itself to us in terms of these qualities of a, of a satisfying love, a rewarding joy, inherited healing, a tangible beauty, and, and meaningful Meaningful labor. And so all of that is available to those who love him. It's like, wow, man, Moses writes the first psalm and he breaks it down. It's like, that's, we need to follow Jesus. We need to follow God. You know, we need to cry out to him and say, oh, wow. And, and you know, and obviously I'm, I'm here this morning and I'm looking around. I'm preaching to the choir. We're followers of Jesus. But it brings us to, you know, a great place that for this morning that, that we can have communion. We can come to the communion table, another form of worship. And we can worship the Lord together. And, I, and I'm sure when you came in, if you didn't get one of these, little communion cups and it has a little wafer that kind of tastes like uh, styrofoam. <laughs> and then that's on top. And I, and I opened it before I got up here. And then the bottom's juice. And so if, you, if everybody has one, if you don't have one, uh, Bob can give you one. Everybody has one? We can, we, can, uh, we can take communion together. And here I want to read this. And this is from the great chapter on the resurrection from Paul the Apostle, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. He says... 
if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we're to be pitied more than all men. You get that? It's like, wow, if this, if this isn't real or if it's just for this life, then, then I pity you. He says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each is his own turn. But each in, in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God and, and God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his den- enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Wow. Let's partake. Lord, we're thankful as, as, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of you. In remembering that, that through you comes life and that you've defeated death in our life. That we've received that free gift of eternal life. For which we're obviously forever grateful. And so, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you that we can come here to... Uh, simple truth, we can worship you. We can't find in your word where we're supposed to sing three songs and read your word, sing a song, and go home. But throughout the whole morning, we worship you. And, and we're thankful that this too shall pass, this pandemic that we're going through. We're thankful that, that you are in control, that you're sovereign. And so we pray that, that we would have humility, Lord, that we would have love for one another. Lord, that we pray that, that you would give those people in the medical field wisdom, Lord, that you know what we need to squash this. We pray that you would give that to us, however you're going to do that. And that it would pass sooner than, than later. But Lord, as, as we leave here today and we, we have this taste of communion in our mouth, Lord, I just pray that, that we wouldn't forget what Moses was talking about. Lord, that, that we would deal with you on a, a personal basis, that we would cry out to you. Lord, we're thankful that, that we realize that we're sinners. And we recognize that Jesus is who he is. And it's from everlasting to everlasting. And so we repent, we turn from the way that we were living, and and we're following you. The craziness of the world, they want to be godless, then they're going to suffer the consequences, just like Moses said. But Lord, we want to suffer the consequences of your love because we follow you. And so, Lord, thank you. And and again, thank you that we can be here together and just pray that uh, you would... We know you're going to continue to reign, and so we'll continue to look to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, God bless you guys. Have a great week. If you need something, call us. Uh, We'll help you take care of it. We do catch skunks, and uh, we'll help you out that way too. So social distance, be safe, and uh, we'll see you next week. God bless you guys.